Weiser, how are you? Great to be here. You're in great demand, except on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, and M the rest of them. You uh, wrote this book, Secret Empires, in which you broke a number of stories, including the Joe and Hunter Biden, I'll call it, corruption story involving Ukraine. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to walk through everything you know about the Bidens in Ukraine. Then I want to walk through everything you know about the Bidens in China. So the American people who watch this program are aware of it because they're not getting any of this in the New York Times and the Washington Post or any of the cable networks where you are basically being prevented from explaining what took place. Then I want to talk about what to me is a nonsensical hullabaloo about the President of the United States, the transcript, and all the rest of that. So let's walk through it. Let's begin with the Bidens in Ukraine from the top. Well, Hunter Biden uh, is, is uh, Joe Biden's son, the son that's still alive. He lost Beau Biden tragically. Um, and up until his father became vice president, he was basically a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., uh, working for the online gambling industry. So he had no background overseas in any of these areas. Uh, once his father became vice president, he started this private investment firm called Rosemont Seneca Partners. Half the capital was provided by Chris Hines, who's John Kerry's stepson. Uh, and another business partner was brought in, who was John Kerry's finance co-chair in 2004. The Ukraine part of this really begins in 2014, Mark. In February of 2014, you'll remember the pro-Russian president Yanukovych is driven from power. Uh, Putin starts flexing his muscles. Russian military forces get involved. That's in February of 2014. The Obama administration responds by saying, we are going to come and help Ukraine. And very significantly, the point person on Obama administration policy is Vice President Joe Biden, who goes to Ukraine almost immediately. Two months after Yanukovych is driven from power and the Russian forces start to invade, a Ukrainian energy company called Burisma decides it's a great idea to hire the vice president's son as a consultant, advisor, and board member. Now, what's important, Mark, to note is that Hunter Biden has no background in energy. He has no background in Ukraine. He's being hired to help them with regulatory compliance. I don't know how he's going to help them with that. But that's really not the reason that he was hired. To this day, do we know anything that he did? Do we know what he did for no, this company? No, we don't know. He made a couple appearances uh, at energy conferences. That's all that he did. But he, what was he being paid? He was being paid $83,000 a month, which was being transferred into financial records in, in, in Morgan Stanley, an account there. So we know the precise amount he was paid because we have those documents. Hunter Biden's business partner, who was also on the board of Burisma, Devin Archer, uh, was charged with financial fraud in 2016. And as a result of that prosecution, those financial records uh, came to light. So there's no ambiguity here. We know precisely how much he was being paid. Um, and to keep in mind that Burisma is a corrupt company. It's, it's probably the most corrupt company in Ukraine. There were lots of Western firms that would not even deal with them partly because it was headed by this Ukrainian oligarch named Zlachevsky, who was the former uh, energy minister in the Yanukovych government, and he basically created Burisma by stealing assets, state assets, and putting them into his own company. So he steals state assets, Ukrainian funds, right. puts them in his own company, right. the company that hires Hunter Biden. Correct. Who's on the board of this company? Uh, it's basically Ukrainians uh, and then the former president of Poland, which there's all kinds of questions about what energy deals were in play there. Um, but this was a company that Western capital firms did not want to get involved in because they were concerned about irregularities. And when Hunter Bo Biden joined the board, the serious fraud office in the UK, which handles matters very seriously, had actually frozen Zlachevsky's assets in bank accounts because of money laundering, all sorts of other serious allegations. So the point is, is Hunter Biden joined forces with a very corrupt oligarch, got a big payday, uh, and he got a payday that he didn't deserve, Mark, because he wasn't selling his expertise. He had none. 
And the key question here that nobody seems to want to ask in the media is, what was he being paid for? He wasn't being paid for his expertise. What was he being paid for? And what were the Ukrainians expecting to get in return? And I think when you overlay the financial payments with the fact that Joe Biden, as point person on Obama administration policy to Ukraine, was steering billions of dollars of Western money to Ukraine, it becomes crystal clear exactly why they were paying him money. They wanted access and they wanted to influence Joe Biden. And Joe Biden's been around a long time, and he had to know exactly why his son was being paid. Well, let me ask you about that. I saw some liberal so-called reporter who said there was a rule the Bidens had (laughs) that Hunter never told his father, the vice president, what kind of business he was involved in. Right. And even though it later was in the press, yeah. Burisma and Hunter Biden's role and so forth, largely you're responsible for it and some others, that there's no evidence that Joe Biden actually read the newspaper. Right, right. <laughs> so it's simply not conceivable, is it, that no. Joe Biden wouldn't know what his son was up to? Right, exactly. I mean, first of all, uh, if, he, if he had been point person on Ukraine policy, which he was, he would know about Burisma because Burisma was a major energy producer. Energy was a key component of Ukraine coming back. And in fact, Joe Biden was responsible for a USAID program designed to rejuvenate the energy sector of which Burisma would benefit. But we also know, based on an interview that Hunter Biden gave to The New Yorker, that in fact, he did talk to his dad about this. And according to Hunter Biden, his father told him, I hope you know what you're doing. So, you know, even his son has contradicted. uh, And a few weeks ago, Joe Biden said he never discussed it with his son in response to Peter Ducey of Fox. Correct. He got very angry. Yes, that's exactly right. So Joe Biden knows about the prosecutor. Yeah. He knows about the company. Yeah. He knows the company's corrupt. He claims the prosecutor's corrupt. Right. Maybe right or wrong. Yeah. And there's this phone conversation where Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, is saying what to whom about the prosecutor? Well, he's telling the, the, the president of the Ukraine uh, that, look, I'm not going to give you this billion dollars of Western aid. Remember, he's the guy that calls the shots here. I'm not giving you this billion dollars of aid unless you fire that prosecutor. Who's investigating the company, Burisma? Correct. And by extension, you would think, potentially, his son. Correct. Yes, that's and potentially exactly right. for that matter. John Kerry's stepson. Yes. Who I, knows? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to know exactly what he's what he was investigating. We know he was investigating Burisma. And we know that based on some reporting from John Solomon, that that investigation involved Hunter Biden. But, you know, look, to me, the bottom line here is Hunter Biden was hired. Why? My contention is he wasn't hired for his expertise. He was hired precisely because Lachevsky, who ran and controlled Burisma, was in trouble. The Brits had seized his assets. The United States and others were raising questions about corruption in Ukraine, and he wanted out of the fix. So whether Hunter Biden at that point in time was directly being investigated is immaterial. The fact is, Lachevsky was. And the bottom line is the Ukrainians buckled and fired the prosecutor. Now, to the claim that he was a corrupt prosecutor. Who knows? Again, me, it's irrelevant. Let me ask you a question. Why does that matter? Exactly. You're the vice president of the United States. We're hearing the Democrats today about talking about affecting a foreign investigation. Right. Biden affected a foreign investigation, whether he thinks the prosecutor is corrupt or not. President of the United States thought Mueller was conflicted up the wazoo, but the Democrats would never have accepted the fact if he fired Mueller. So you actually have Biden reaching into the Ukraine, demanding that they fire this prosecutor who's investigating the company that his son is tied to, and blackmailing them. Right. You want a billion dollars in American aid, you'll get rid of that guy. And what does he say? I've got six hours. This is on tape. Mm -hmm. I've got six hours. He needs to be gone. And he brags at the Council of Foreign Relations event a year ago or so? Yes. That that's exactly what they did. Right. Now, let me ask you a question. You've pretty much written about all this. Yes. Have you been contacted by a single Democrat chairman in the House of Representatives to testify? No. Not by Jerry Nadler? No. Not by Elijah Cummings? No. Have you been asked to sit down with Nancy Pelosi to discuss your findings? No. 
Have you been asked by a single Republican chairman, let's start with the Senate Intelligence Committee, to meet no. with them? No. How about the Senate Judiciary Committee? No. How about the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? No. They don't, nobody wants to talk to you. That's right. That's and right. And you have information. Yes. That has been corroborated now. Correct. And nobody cares. Yeah, and nobody cares. And this is the challenge we face, Mark, with a lot of these issues. And you've talked about this, um, really, I mean, throughout your public life. I mean, the challenge with these kinds of issues is, in Joe Biden's case, Ukraine, China, which we'll talk about later, um, it, it's systematic, it's massive and, and, and corrupt, and I think unprecedented. But there are lots of people in this town on both sides of the aisle that play the same game. And here's the dilemma you have. Uh, if you, let's say, happen to be a, a Republican congressman from somewhere, uh, maybe you're in this game or maybe you want to get in this game. Well, if you call out Joe Biden, you immediately close off avenues for your own family to become wealthy. I mean, it's, it's one of the most popular common games in Washington. Do you have any expectation? that any of these six chairmen handpicked by Nancy Pelosi with her phony impeachment inquiry, because they want to vote on the floor of the House, will call you to testify? No, no. When we come back, I have a question for you. We have a letter here dated May 4, 2018, on United States Senate stationery to the general prosecutor, another general prosecutor, of the Ukraine, signed by Dick Durbin, the number three Democrat in the United States Senate, works for Schumer, signed by Patrick Leahy, the oldest serving member, the longest serving member of the United States Senate, and Robert Menendez, who I believe is the ranking Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, threatening the Ukraine that if they don't assist Robert Mueller in his investigation involving the President of the United States, that there may be a price to pay. I want to get into this letter with you and ask you, about the hypocrisy of the Democrat Party, and quite frankly, the media, in its coverage of this matter, was brought to my attention in, most public, in the public by Mark Thiessen in a column in the Washington Post, not by investigative reporters at any of these uh, newspapers and so forth. So I want to pursue that when we come back. Folks, don't forget, you can watch me on Levin TV, Levin TV, most weeknights. Just go to blazetv.com slash mark to sign up, blazetv.com slash mark, or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. This is a great book, Secret Empires by Peter. I hope you'll acquire your copy. And this book, too, about our wonderful media, Unfreedom of the Press. I hope you'll get your copy as well. We'll be right back. Three longtime serving Democrat senators, they have no compunction whatsoever about contacting the general prosecutor, in the Ukraine to stiff arm them, to make demands, very explicit demands, unlike the President of the United States in the transcript that we'll get to in a moment that the public has seen over the course of the last few days. And in part it says, on May 2, the New York Times reported that your office effectively froze investigations into four open cases in Ukraine in April, thereby eliminating scope for cooperation with the Mueller probe into related issues. So they're trying to juice the prosecutor to work with Mueller. They go on later. Blocking cooperation with the Mueller probe potentially cuts off a significant opportunity for Ukrainian law enforcement to conduct a more thorough inquiry into possible crimes committed during uh, the prior president's administration. Isn't that kind of what the president's saying? Right. About Biden? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And then they appoint just in case the general prosecutor is not smart to understand the pressure that these three Democrat senators are placing on him. One, has your office taken any steps to restrict cooperation with the investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller? If so, why? It's like they're, they're taking a deposition. Two, did any individual from the Trump administration or anyone acting on its behalf encourage Ukrainian government or law enforcement officials not to cooperate with the investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller? Three, now, this is to a foreign prosecutor of another government. Was the Mueller probe raised in any way during discussions between your government and U.S. officials, including around the meeting of Presidents Trump's and Poroshenko in New York in 2017? So these three Democrats, powerful, powerful Democrats, are saying to the general prosecutor, a senior official, in the Ukraine administration, 
you better be investigating Donald Trump. You better be assisting this special counsel. And we have some specific questions. If not, why not? When did you last talk to Trump in 2017? And on and on and on. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable, I think, in a couple levels, Mark. First of all, you're, you're right. I mean, the tone is it's a very direct uh, legal document, basically saying we're watching you and we expect your cooperation. Uh, and the threat is somewhat implied because if you look at those three members of the Senate, uh, anybody in Ukraine in authority, and certainly uh, this gentleman would know, knows that the purse strings of Ukrainian aid runs through Congress. And if you've got individuals who are on the, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, for example, they need to sign off on any sort of budgetary authority. So it's very troubling. And again, it shows this double standard. Uh, certain people are to be investigated. Certain people are not. Foreign officials are supposed to cooperate with certain investigations, not cooperate with others. And I think this is one of the things that drives Americans crazy. I know people, I know you know people that are generally apolitical. They're, they're not that engaged, but what they are concerned about uh, and frankly very angry about is the fact that we seem to have a two-tiered system of justice. Certain political figures get investigated, others don't. Uh, there's a certain level of expectation of cooperation with some and not with others. And this kind of goes to the heart of the matter. All the hysteria uh, of the buildup to sort of the Trump conversation with the Ukrainian president was predicated on these sort of exaggerated notions of this threatening tone, uh, the fact that it was tied to aid, the fact that he wanted him to basically finger Biden. All lies. Exactly. It comes out and it's, it's very conversational. It's saying, hey, just, you know, uh, uh, you know talk to my attorney general. Well, let's get to this. It. We and the world now has this transcript, which is extraordinary. This is uh, the, the first-hand first -hand account by a number of people who take notes during the course of the president's conversation. They get together, they compare their notes, and they write this up. There's not a recording. I don't know of another time when a transcript of this sort has ever been released, ever. And, you know, others have been saying, well, why don't we have a transcript of Joe Biden's conversation when he wanted that prosecutor fired? Right. Or his other various conversations with the Ukrainians. How about his conversations with the Chinese, which we'll get to soon? For that matter, what about Obama's conversations with heads right. of states? Those would be fascinating. Right. But only Trump and only this conversation, because we have a whistleblower who's not a whistleblower, who doesn't have firsthand knowledge of anything. Matter of fact, we now know more than the whistleblower. Correct. We have the transcript, but they still want to hear from the whistleblower. Right. Who just happens to be represented by a lawyer who worked for Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer. Right. I think the American people are going to have about enough of all this. So we read this transcript. You and I have read this transcript. What the television graphics aren't showing is there's a long discussion about all kinds of things. Corruption in the Ukraine, how you can work better with us. And during the course of this conversation, this was not a phone call where Donald Trump calls the newly elected president of the Ukraine and says, hey, by the way, we've got military aid that you want. I want to get Biden. Now, what are you going to do about it? There's nothing like that in here. Right, right. Zippo. Right. It's conversational. And here's the part. Ready? I heard you had a prosecutor. And this is part of a long conversation where the president of Ukraine is actually bringing up investigations more than the president of the United States. I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good and he was shut down, and that's really unfair. A lot of, a lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut your very good prosecutor down, and you had some very bad people involved. Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. Now, he, did, he wasn't the first one to bring up Giuliani. The president of Ukraine right. brought up Giuliani. And he says uh, he was the mayor of New York City, a great mayor, and I would like him to call you. And I will ask him to call you along with the attorney general, of the attorney general of the United States. So basically, he's going through proper channels. Rudy very much knows what's happening, and he's a very capable guy. If you could speak to him, that would be great. Again, it was the president of the Ukraine who first brought up Rudy Giuliani. The former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news. Obama appointee, and the new people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news, so I just want to let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk of Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that, so whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me.
Is he demanding a criminal investigation of Joe Biden here? Uh, uh, imagine putting that next to Joe Biden's version of his conversation with the Ukrainian authorities to get the prosecutor fired. No. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a stark I have stark. to take a break. I want you to pick up right where we left off. Right. Your interpretation of this versus the media's interpretation. We'll be right back. I read from the letter of the senators. The president's quite passive. He's not directing, he's not threatening. The senators are directing and they're threatening and they're warning. So the president says to the president of the Ukraine, who brings this stuff up, he says, yeah, Rudy's a good guy. I'm gonna have him call you uh, and I'd like you to talk to the attorney general too. He doesn't say, I want you to get Biden. I want you to open a criminal investigation. I wanna bring this guy down. Remember, he doesn't even know this is gonna be made public. Right, yeah. So what's the problem? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, the tone, his tone is very different than Biden's tone uh, in, in Biden's version of his conversation with the Ukrainians. It's very different than the tone uh, that the senators sent to uh, the Ukrainians on this issue. But I would go further, Mark, in saying that, that President Trump would be negligent if he did not bring this matter up. And here's why. Ukraine is one of those countries that has all sorts of problems. One of those problems is corruption. And it's one of those countries where you have a political class in the United States which sort of feasts off of opportunities to enrich themselves in countries like Ukraine. You could add Kazakhstan to that list. You could go to Nigeria. The point is, these are legitimate issues for a president to raise. And if the you know, members of a family of the vice president of the United States are self-enriching and engaged in potentially uh, criminal behavior, at a minimum corrupt behavior, it ought to be looked at. And the notion that somehow you know, he should take a hands-off approach, it's not legitimate to even mention Biden's name, is ridiculous. And he's reading this. It's in the public press. It's right. in your book. Yeah. So Hillary Clinton, who in my view violated the Espionage Act repeatedly, she and her husband become enormously wealthy yeah. since they left the yeah. White House and so forth. You can't investigate her. Right. Because she's not running for anything anymore. Right. Joe Biden, who might run for something, mm -hmm. you can't investigate him because he might run for something. Right. Uh, meanwhile, Donald Trump is under nonstop investigation. Right. And that's okay. When you have politicians pressing prosecutors, pressing prosecution, accusing him of crimes and all, that's okay. But don't talk about Lunch Bucket Joe and his son. Right. Don Jr. said something to me the other day that is so true. Can you imagine if he'd been Hunter Biden? <laughs> and can you imagine if... Yeah. The president had been Joe Biden and made that call. What do you think would have happened? No, oh, I, I think we all know what would have happened. I mean, imagine uh, we're going to talk uh, you know, about China in a minute. But imagine um, if Don Jr. flew over on Air Force One with his dad and inked a one point five billion dollar deal, let's say in an area he has no background in like telecommunications. Uh, uh, Washington be going ballistic. I would be going ballistic. Uh, and rightfully so. So it'd be, it's a completely different circumstance in the way the response is. And that's what I think so infuriates people. There are certain people that are supposed to be protected. Uh, Biden seems to be one of those. When, when my book came out, uh, hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, I did, did your radio show, I uh, did hits on Fox, got no contact whatsoever from the mainstream media. And you outlets. write about Republicans in your book. Absolutely. But they don't want to hear. No, they don't want to hear any of it. And part of it is there's a caste system in Washington, D.C. that they protect. And I think one of the reasons that there is so much animosity towards Trump, some of it's ideological, some of it's style or whatever, but a lot of it is he represents a massive disruption to the business model of Washington, D.C., which is you come in, you juice in your family, you juice in your friends, you serve in, in public service, you come out rich, and when you leave office, you cash in even further. He represents a threat and a challenge to that, and they don't like it. Lots of people from both political parties. So to me, this is the heart of the matter. If it's not possible to investigate Joe Biden now, then it's never possible to investigate him. All these things we're talking about, Mark, happened when he was vice president of the United States. 
His son flew with him on Air Force Two. He was the point person on critically important national security issues with foreign governments. And in A those instances, there's only two countries where Joe Biden was point person for U.S. policy. And in both countries... His son just happened to cash in, getting paid huge sums of money in areas that he had no background or expertise. And yet the media doesn't seem to think this is a big deal. Donald Trump comes into government not to enrich himself. I'm sure he's lost money. Yes. Don Jr. has nothing to do with any of this. They try to drag him down. Eric Trump, Ivanka Trump, the whole Trump family. They issue subpoenas like issuing lollipops, you know, after you go to the dentist when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when it comes to the Bidens, not one subpoena has been issued by either body of Congress, Republicans right. or Democrats. Right. When it comes to Hunter Biden, nobody wants to look at his bank account. Right. Nobody wants to interview his accountants. Nobody wants to do anything. And they've twisted this massive Biden corruption scandal into a Donald Trump scandal, right, right. high crimes and misdemeanor. You right. know what? That's a bridge too far. The American people aren't going to buy this crap. When we come back, I want to talk about China. Folks, don't forget, most weeknights you can see me on Levin TV. Go to blazetv.com slash mark to sign up. blazetv.com slash mark. Or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. Don't forget, get your copy of Unfreedom of the Press and Secret Empires by my friend Peter Schweizer. We'll be right back. No thanks to the media that doesn't really explain it. What did you discover with respect to Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and others in Red China? Well, China is the great marketplace that everybody seems to be going to, right? Or at least they were during the Obama administration. And the same thing uh, applied with the Bidens. Uh, the story really begins in December of 2013. Joe Biden is going to Asia for a series of meetings. The center of, of those meetings is going to be with Chinese officials. Uh, and Hunter Biden is on Air Force Two with him. Um, now, you would look at the public accounts and think this was just sort of a social thing. Uh, but during the time that they were in Beijing, we don't really know what Hunter was doing. Uh, there's no schedule uh, of his meetings. But Joe Biden was meeting with Chinese officials, and he was criticized by The Washington Post and others for being soft. Um, the Chinese had erected these air defense zones in the South uh, China Sea. They're making these territorial claims. Joe Biden never even brought up publicly the fact that the, those issues existed. So he was very soft on the Chinese. Curiously, 10 days after they come back from that trip, Hunter Biden's boutique investment firm, Rosemont Seneca Partners, inks a $1 billion, with a B, deal with the Chinese government, not a Chinese bank in the country, the Chinese government. Uh, and they create something called Bohai Harvest RST. Um, and this is basically the Chinese government putting a billion dollars in, then it's expanded to $1.5 billion. Uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to invest in assets in the United States and elsewhere, and Hunter Biden's going to help them do it. Now, to put it, this into context, Mark, this little boutique firm that Hunter Biden has, Rosemont Seneca Partners, he has no background in private equity, he has no background in China, gets a deal that's part of the Shanghai free trade zone that no other investment bank has. Not Goldman Sachs, not Deutsche Bank, none of them do. They're going to get Chinese government money in the Shanghai free trade zone and they're going to invest in the United States and elsewhere. And what they end up doing, Mark, is buying Companies. Let me stop you right there. Yeah. So they don't need this little boutique firm <laughs> no. to invest $1.5 billion. No. no. But it's better if they can wash it through Hunter Biden's company. Right. Ten days after the vice president was in China on official business with his son trotting along on Air Force Two. Right. Okay. Exactly. And, and they also need Hunter Biden's help, though, because the investments they make in this company, Bohai Harvest, RST. Now, remember, Hunter Biden's on the board of directors of this financial firm, and his business partner, Devin Archer, is on the investment committee. They start buying assets in the United States that are dual-use technologies. Uh, dual use civilian and military correct exactly so it, it has military implications they buy this precision tool company uh, creates anti-vibration technologies called Hennigus in Michigan 
That transaction is required approval by CFIUS. What's CFIUS? CFIUS is the federal government's Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. Different cabinet officials or their surrogates have to actually approve these deals. Exactly, because they're militarily sensitive. And, and look, I think it's pretty clear if you have the son of the vice president involved with the investment firm that's making this investment, even though it's the Chinese government doing it, that's pretty darn good cover. Uh, there's another investment they make in China General Nuclear, CGN, which is a company based in Hong Kong. Uh, they become shareholders in this. Again, the son of the vice presidents on the board of directors of this company, they buy part of CGN. Within a year, our FBI is charging CGN with stealing nuclear secrets in the United States. So these are the kinds of transactions that are occurring. The problem from the standpoint of Hunter Biden is, we have no idea how much he was being paid. And this is the only the first deal that he does in China. There's another one called Rosemont Realty, which is a real estate firm. Hunter Biden is a co-founder of this real estate firm. Uh, a Chinese company called Gemini Investments, which is linked to Costco, which is a famous Chinese company tied to the Chinese military. Gemini comes in and buys 75% of Rosemont Realty in 2015. So Hunter Biden is doing deals in Ukraine. He's also doing deals in China. But he's awash in Chinese money. Yes. And he is, you're right, he's, he's kind of, the, in part, the front man to, get, to open the door. Oh, that's Hunter Biden. Correct. And um, I guess my question to you is this. Has a single committee in Congress looked into this? No. No. Senate Republicans? No. Gerald Nadler? No. Has CNN done a report on this? No. MSNBC? No. Anybody talking to you about this in the mainstream so-called media? We had a reporter from the Wall Street Journal that, when the book came out, ran a story, uh, talked about the implications, the bipartisan uh, nature of it, of, of this story. That's it. And that's been it. No other interest. And again, I think the problem here is China is a, a viewed as a place on the globe where you can go make a lot of money if you are politically connected. And the Obama administration's policies towards China? Very became, passive. Very passive, became very soft. And Joe Biden, who was once very hawkish on China, on human rights, South China Sea, Taiwan, uh, has become very soft. In fact, in, in recent months on the, on the campaign, he's poo-pooed the fact that China represents any kind of threat, political or otherwise, to the United States. Um, but the, Even though our own defense establishment says they are the greatest threat facing the United States of America, and we better wake up to it. That's, that's exactly right. The, the Pentagon expects that by 2030, the Chinese will surpass the United States Navy as the most powerful Navy in the world. Now, according to the Democrats, we better not investigate this, right. because to do so is political. Right. And that's an impeachable offense against Trump. Right. More when I return. couple of loose ends here. Hunter Biden's doing a lot of foreign business, making a hell of a lot of money. Do you know if he was registered as a foreign agent with the Department of Justice? No, he never registered. He never registered? No. You know, in recent months, we've seen people prosecuted on this issue. Greg Craig, even though he was found innocent. Manafort, one of the charges against him. Why is nobody prosecuting Hunter Biden at least on that violation. It, this is one of the mysteries and, and the reason that I've called for an investigation by the Department of Justice to look into these transactions and these dealings and also for the Senate to have him and Joe Biden come to testify. You know, look, Mark, we live in this insane world where if Joe Biden has, you know, $5,000 in GE stock, he needs to disclose it. If he gets $500 campaign contribution from somebody, he has to disclose it. But if his son does a billion dollar private equity deal with a foreign government that's our chief rival, there's no disclosure requirement. But shouldn't there be, to, if past is prologue, and I mean recent past, yeah. a special counsel based on the Schumer argument? We can't expect the Trump administration to fairly investigate Joe Biden. And in order to take politics out of it, right. we need a special counsel. Right. So shouldn't there be a special counsel investigating the Bidens? Or is the appointment of that even considered political? In other words, 
they've so immunized themselves, and the media have helped immunize the Democrats. Right. You can't investigate Hillary Clinton. You can't investigate Joe Biden. You can't right. investigate any of the Democrats. Right. Because that's political. On yeah. the other hand, they can investigate you, your family, your finances, issue a hundred subpoenas against the president of the United States, and that's constitutional. Right. Well, I think the American people can be a little fed up with this. I, I think they should as well. And and you know, look, I think at the end of the day, people need to know. Uh, you know, who is paying the piper? The notion that the Bidens would not be influenced by the Chinese or by anybody else because they were sending money to them uh, is ridiculous. I mean, we, we chase stories and they're legitimate stories about, you know, Wall Street firms donating to certain candidates. Do they get access? You know, if you're getting access because you write a $20,000 pack check uh, to a candidate, you are certainly getting access uh, if you're giving private equity deals. And the bottom line is, Mark, in all the stuff we've talked about, is in black and white. It's in public record. No anonymous sources, no made-up dossier, no third-person hearsay. These are all facts. You know, now, Peter, I, I even remember the Chinese military pouring millions of dollars into the DNC and into the Clinton re-election effort. There was never an independent counsel appointed to investigate that. Guys walking into the DNC with, with serially numbered bills in paper bags the Riotti Group, remember all that? Yes, absolutely. No independent counsel investigation, no Democrat calls for any kind of investigation, nothing of the kind. Here we have this ridiculous transcript, which should never have been released under separation of powers authority. And I'm here, and they're parsing words. Well, maybe he meant this, maybe it was Tuesday and he should have done this, and, and maybe he shouldn't have brought that up. And, and I'm reading, what's the problem? Right. Particularly given the context of all these other things that are taking place and have gone on. Yeah. We'll be right back.